when I grew up, I'm 27, but when I grew up, uh, we saw numbers wherever we went. Uh, and in this regard, I want to relate three stories. In my neighborhood in Jerusalem, which is a pretty devout neighborhood, Erev Yom Kippur, the eve of Yom Kippur, is the most crowded day in the men mikvah, the ritual bath. And it is so boisterous and noisy and yeah. And I cannot describe this delicately because in the mikvah there's no way to conceal because everything is revealed. And everyone's on top of each other and everyone's wishing good yantav, good yar. It's very boisterous and yeah. And there's one kid from across the street from the Or Sameach Yeshiva for Beginners. How do I know he's from Or Sameach? It said on his t-shirt, Or Sameach Wrestling. I'm just joking. He had an earring and a ponytail. Clearly he was neither a Chassid nor a Jerusalemite. And he felt legitimately very much out of place. And he put his arms, his hands, his palms over his biceps, very apparent to me and to others, that he had a tattoo that was not appropriate for the eve of Yom Kippur. I dare say not appropriate for Gansh or Freilach, but certainly not the eve of Yom Kippur. And the people in this mikvah are not especially subtle, about as subtle as heavy metal is subtle. And they're gawking and gaping this poor kid who's highly embarrassed. He's about to step into the pool and he slips and trips and grabs the rail. And there's this roaring silence in the mikvah. Sphinx-like silence. Picture a forest after tree is felled. Imagine the mudville statement after mighty Casey struck out. And no one is moving. And these lewd and gaudy tattoos are flying through the air. When I say lewd, I mean these were not anchors. You couldn't have had anything less appropriate for the eve of Yom Kippur. And the people in the mikvah, which before were so boisterous and now went absolutely silent. You could hear heartbeats. The third kid turned alabaster. I saw him cogitating, he'll jump in, he'll never come out. He died a thousand deaths. In my life, I have never ever seen such embarrassment. And before it was so noisy, and now nobody was moving. And then an elderly neighbor of mine, this story happened 19 years ago, walked across the moist marble floor. I can still hear in my ears the thwack, 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 as he walked across the moist marble floor and went over to this kid who was more dead than alive and said to him this heavily Yiddishy, European accent in English, don't worry, young man. I also have a tattoo. Pointing numbers going up his arm. In other words, I went through my Gehenna, and you went through your Gehenna. Let's begin Yom Kippur together. Kid came back to life. Spontaneously, everyone over and wished him a good year and a Shana Tova. And I saw how one small thing can make all the difference in the world. I have a friend. It's actually a friend of a friend. We share a friend. He's a psychiatrist in New York named... Dr. Isaac Hirschkopf wrote a book on depression entitled Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. And Ike Hirschkopf grew up in Washington Heights in the 50s. And in the 50s in Washington Heights, you saw numbers wherever you went. Particularly in the summer, they would vacation in the Rockaways, and of course you saw numbers, to the extent that when he was nine years old, he asked his mother, when will I get my numbers? Which caused her to go out of the kitchen crying. And Dr. Hirschkopf's uncle was a physician in the Catskill Mountains. And one of his patients was none other than the famous great rabbinic leader, Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. And the doctor's wife, Ike's aunt, was his receptionist. And she called up, Ike, would you like to meet Rabbi Feinstein? What kid who grew up in Washington Heights in the 50s wouldn't give the right arm to meet Rabbi Moshe Feinstein? He said, of course. And he scrubbed his face and put on his yunta finery and he's sitting in the waiting room with his religious book, looking as religious as he can, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. waiting for Rabbi Feinstein to walk in. He'll jump up and hit the ceiling. And he's waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally, it gets fuller, more and more filled up. Rabbi Feinstein walks in. Ike jumps up. And his aunt goes over. And she goes over and says, Rabbi Feinstein, I'm very sorry. There's a lot of people here. You're going to have to wait your turn. And she plants a kiss on both cheeks. Ike Hirschkopf melted into the floorboards. When he was finally able to resuscitate, he climbed over and his halting, broken Yiddish, he said, my aunt is not religious. She's unaware. 
And Rav said, shh. And he pointed to the numbers on her arm. He said, she's holier than I. And lastly, they asked the Satmar Rebbe, who should we go to to get a blessing, to seek a blessing? He said, go to Shul. And when you see men putting on their tefillin, and you see the numbers, these are people who have their passport to heaven engraved on their flesh. Those are the ones you can seek a blessing from. So in the time that we have, and I neglected to thank this great coalition that was assembled. Thank you all for coming, not to mention the weather. Uh, us Israelis, it's, uh, it's, it's really weather. I want to try and highlight certain things that maybe we're not so familiar with regarding the Holocaust. First of all, we're all aware of the fact that we lost one-third of our people in the Holocaust. Six million Jews, contemporary research is closer to seven million. For the religious community, it wasn't a loss of one-third. At the time of the Holocaust, there were three poorly attended yeshiva high schools in America. There wasn't one girl's school. There wasn't one kolel. The number of boys learning at a yeshiva level in Israel was under 500, which means the heart and soul of religious Jewry was in Lithuania, Latvia, Romania, Hungary, Poland, White Russia. That was not decimated, that was annihilated. Over 97%. And you look around, this rejuvenation has got to be one of the greatest miracles of all time. So we begin with 1938, which is a watershed year in the destruction of world Jewry. Beginning with March of 1938, the Anschluss, Hitler believed two countries who speak the same language should have the same flag. So a vote was taken in Austria, and 99.7% what happened to the quarter million Jews? Forgot to vote that day, very democratic elections. And the Austrians claimed that it was done against their will. I'm a tour guide in Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust Memorial Museum, and there's footage of the Anschluss. You see the Austrians literally jumping for joy, greeting Hitler's arrival. And they said it was gone, done against our will. Oh, contraire, with their own accord and volition, they cheered him on. And what happened was that from 1933, when the Nazis came to power in January, Jews were free game in Germany. You wished to pillage, plunder, rape, molest. You could do whatever you wished, and have no, a Jew had no license to go to the police. But the poor Austrians, ay, 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 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, through March of 38, they were protected citizens. And the anti-Semitism in Austria was like a pressure cooker when the lid flew off. The old men and women were forced to clean the streets. And they're pretty well-known pictures. In the background are the police with their arms folded, sof kol sof. Finally, finally, Jews are doing something productive and not just counting their money. So children were thrown into the icy river. Had they try and get out, bricks were thrown at their head. And these pictures, it's a year and a half before the war begins, are all sent back to the West. The pictures, the video. And in America, there is distress about the plight of the suffering and the arrest of one Austrian Jew. His name was, pardon me? Einstein's a German Jew who was already in America at that time. His name was Dr. Sigmund Freud. Well, that's the right answer. And the way the mind works, which is kind of funny to say about Freud, but <laughs> the way the mind works is that it's easier to think about one over a quarter of a million. It's easier to think about Anne Frank over six million. It's easier to think about six million paper clips over six million souls. And that's the work which I try and do, is try and make the story more personal. What's the most famous story of the Holocaust? It's not a hard question. Anne Frank. Anne Frank. Now, Anne's story is not a reflective story. Anne wasn't in the ghettos, wasn't in the camps. She had a roof over her head, a modicum of food. But because it's a story, it's easier to relate to it. In this regard, I want to tell you, just right away segue to our book. Uh, what happened was, Here's the book. What happened was, is we got this idea, the stories of children, I call this the final frontier of Holocaust literature, because as a rule, Viv, is that you? I can't tell. OK, the Seder. Uh, as a rule, everyone who survived the Holocaust was very anxious to relate their story and how they had suffered understandably. But the children couldn't tell the story then, 
and it hasn't been told since, more or less. So we had this idea to try and gather stories of children from across the Holocaust kingdom, different socioeconomic groups, boys, girls, religious, not religious, and put them in a book, and through their compelling stories, relate the story of the Holocaust. That was the idea. And we had a very draconian deadline after 14 years. Thank you, Viv, for couldn't have done it without you. Barely did it with you, but oh, that was somewhat ungracious. Vivian was my very, very talented editor. Uh, and we're going to try and work on her for the future as well. And uh, after 14 years, finally made a draconian deadline, and we completed the book. However, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We had neglected to produce a cover. Now, cover is a very important component of a book. Whoever tells me they don't judge a book by its cover, I know they never tried to sell a book. So we had to go to press, and I put my team on it. That means my kids. And we're going through all the archives. And then we came across this picture. I don't know if you can see from the distance, which I think is a very dramatic picture, a picture that was shot exactly one year ago, one, pardon me, exactly 71 years ago on the liberation of Auschwitz. It's a large picture of children, and we zoomed in. And the, the copyright holder is the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. So I requested permission to use the picture for a cover. And they said, no problem. You'll have it in three weeks. Three weeks? I don't know if I had three days. And you'll pardon me for being an Israeli, but I thought what's indicated here is protexia, just getting the right connections. And I have a friend in Baltimore, very powerful individual. They say that in his cell phone, he has every senator and congressman's private number. And I figured Baltimore, Washington, I'm sure a shoe in he has a connection in the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. And his son learns in yeshiva adjacent to my house in Jerusalem. So I ran to the yeshiva and said, Aryeh, is your father connected to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington? Which I thought was just a rhetorical question. And he said, no. <laughs> I'm so disenchanted, crestfallen, melancholy. And I'm walking out of the room, and he said to me, but my mother is on the board. <laughs> I was going to wring his neck. <laughs> his mother is a judge, Judge Chaya Friedman. I sent her an email. I said, Chaya, I need your help desperately. I gave her the tag number. I need this picture yesterday. And when you request a picture for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, you have to sign an affidavit. You're not going to make any alteration. And I wrote, I'm going to make this change, and this change, and that change, and this change, and that change, this change, this change, that change. And the next day, I had the picture. Great. However. Ay, 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 ay. In sync with my methodology of teaching, which I just explained to you, I'm always trying to highlight the individual. And what's unique about my tour in Yad Vashem is I'm always telling stories. It sort of blows my mind how other tour guides unspool data and statistics that no one can relate to. We're talking about an infinite crime. So I'm always telling stories. And I decided what I wanted to do was, in sync with that methodology, would be to color and highlight one child. The picture is sepia, I wanted to color one. And I didn't have permission for this. And I felt this required special permission. So right away, again, I sent an email to Judge Friedman. I said, Chaya, I'm really desperate. I'm under the gun. I need you to get permission that I can color one child and highlight it. And she wrote back, she's in the middle of convening a murder trial, and she has no time. So I wrote her back, this is killing me. <laughs> and uh, I prevailed upon her, and she wrote me back the next day, the day that we're going to press, Yay, yay, nay, nay. I cannot assure you they'll get permission, but I made the request. And I thought, come on. This is apple pie, Holocaust. Who's going to have a problem with this? Three hours we're going to press, and I'm going to use the technical term. It's called the press queue. And we were using the largest press in Israel, arguably the largest press in the Middle East. And when you have a press queue, if you don't show up and print, you still pay for it. And you want to print the next day, too late. You've got to get on queue all over again. So we were going to press at 10 o'clock at night. Three hours, we were, to be accurate, two hours and 48 minutes before the press queue. I get an email, dear Rabbi Teller, I regret to inform you from the head of archivist, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, I regret to inform you that you may not use the picture. If you wish to use it in its pristine state without any alteration, you may. But once you make a change whatsoever, you have no permission. And this fellow that you want to color has just spoken out, he's very sensitive, and our legal department said unequivocally, you may not use the picture. 
Shrek and a half. And I already had the plates burned. They were on the drums. In two and a half hours, we're going to have 10,000 covers. What to do? But I'm not such a pushover, a bit of a fighter. And I wrote her back. I said, would you please send me his phone number? I'd like to speak with him. One hour and 52 minutes before press queue, I get an email. We don't even know his name. We don't know where he lives. I said, but, but, but you just told me. He's very sensitive. He spoke out. And 46 minutes before press queue, she sends me an online clipping. And it was apparent from this clipping, conjecture, that his last name or first name was Hirsch, and he lives in Europe. There's a bunch of people, and I had to find them. <laughs> now I have to find, with 42 minutes to go, maybe Hirsch in Europe. And I don't know if maybe is his first name or his last name. <laughs> so Sherlock Teller concludes, where would an Auschwitz survivor who decides to live in Europe live? And I concluded, well, Russia's not Europe. England's not Europe. Israel's not Europe. And for good measure, I eliminated Luxembourg and Liechtenstein. We're down to 16 countries <laughs> with 38 minutes to go. And then I thought, where would he live? And then I thought, if you look at the picture, the kid looks pretty good. So I knew he couldn't be a Pole. <laughs> to be in this shape, he'd have to be Hungarian. Hungary was invaded March 1944. To be in this shape, it wouldn't be a Pole. Most likely Hungarian. And then I think, where would a Hungarian live in Europe? Yeah. So I right away eliminated, Fr I eliminated France, I eliminated the ne Netherlands, and I concluded, Sherlock Teller, it must be either Switzerland or Belgium. And I have a very clever friend who lives in Switzerland, Moshe Luzer, and he works for IBM. What a shidduch. So I call up Moshe Luzer, I said, Moshe Luzer, I need you to find me maybe Hirsch in Switzerland, an Auschwitz survivor. You want to run that first name by me again? So I don't know if it's the first name or the last name, but there's Hirsch in there. So he said to me, Hanoch, what did you drink? I said, I didn't drink anything, but I got to find this guy, and there's no time. And he said to me, you know, I work for IBM. You get me a first name, a last name, I'll find him. And if he's religious, I might even know him. I said, I don't know if he's religious. I don't know his first name, and I think his last name. You know what I said? You know what? I'm sure he's Hungarian. Try Gavor or Tibor Hirsch. That's the Hungarian equivalent of Mike or Steve. I hear him clicking on the keyboard. Gavor Hirsch, 84-year-old engineer. Here's his phone number. <laughs> Nine minutes to go, I call him up. He gives me permission. I race off an email to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum to the head archivist. I said, I have permission. If you have any questions, here's his phone number. And I took that as an auspicious omen for the book. I want you to know that it would be harder for me to parallel park than it was for me to find this guy Hirsch in Europe with one phone call. OK, we move on to 1938. In the fall is the Munich conference where the great appeaser, Neville Chamberlain, hands over Czechoslovakia to Hitler. And Hitler concludes, I have now Austria and Czechoslovakia. And I've not yet fired a shot. My people are becoming soft. I have to whip them into shape. Because a war means all kinds of hardship, even on the home front. There's body bags coming back by the truckload, and there's scarcity. And how do you whip them into shape? Always the same recipe. You pick on the Jews. And every Jew of Polish ancestry is thrown over the border, literally thrown over the border. Sir Martin Gilbert writes that the road out of Germany was red with Jewish blood. And one fellow who's banished is a fellow by the name of Zundel Greenspan, a tailor, who writes a postcard to his son Herschel studying in Paris describing how appalling the conditions are. No food, no shelter. They're lying in pigsties with the excrement still present. Herschel is appalled and wants to alert the world. Gets hold of a pistol, goes into the German embassy and shoots the first ambassador. He sees a thoroughly unimportant young ambassador, Ernst von, von Roth, on November 7th, 1938. Two days later, he will succumb to his wounds. We now know the one who actually killed him was Hitler's personal physician, front page article in the New York Times two and a half years ago. 
But now there's a canard, which is going to be the catalytic enzyme for the culminating event of 1938, Kristallnacht. The night, November 9th, 1938, every synagogue is put to the torch. Every Jewish business is raided at night at broken glass. The Jews could not collect the 25 million Reichmarks in insurance. They had to repair the shops on their own expense. And then they were organized and expropriated and given to the Nazis. The all, like all of Europe, all glass is imported from Belgium. The amount of glass that was broken was more than seven times the yearly import of glass. And the Jewish community was fined one billion Reichmarks for the damage that was caused, which brought German Jewry to grinding poverty. All the ingredients of a typical pogrom. Men are murdered, women are raped, children are beaten. Homes are raided. And these pictures, again, are sent to the West. And you see this horrific footage. And there's agitation in America to do something. So the President of the United States, named after the highway in Manhattan, who is the consummate politician, wants to do something grandiose, which will accomplish nothing. So he convenes the Avion Conference on Lake Geneva, the border of Switzerland and France. And for the Jews who hoped that this would be an opportunity for them, we'll find out it is their death knell. 33 countries are invited, and each and every country is told an invitation. No one is expected to change their quota. We're not changing it, said America. And every country is given an opportunity to speak about what they're going to do to help out these Jewish refugees. Australia says, we don't have any room for Jews. Today, 2016, Australia is 95% barren but they have no room. Nova Scotia, pardon me, New Zealand says more or less the same. Argentina says, we have more Jews than America has. We've let in more Jews, and that's true. France says, we've taken in more than anyone. In Switzerland, Heinrich Rotman, the rabid vitriolic anti-Semite, head of the Swiss border control, gets up and says, we have as much need for the Jews as the Germans have. And here's a conference on behalf of Jewish refugees, and everyone gets up and proclaims how no one's going to help. And the only one who got the message was Hitler himself. And he said, you're such talkers, but we speak the truth. A reporter for the Herald Tribune wrote that avian backwards spells naive. So FDR has carved out this conference to do nothing, and it does it very well. By the way, as I'm sure you know, American Jewry was farshikered, intoxicated with FDR. Yeah, they still are. yeah, you ask a Jew in the 30s, who's a leader? They would respond in Yiddish, in the Drei Welten, there's three worlds. The word for world, world in Yiddish is, is Welt. In the Drei Welten, the three worlds. Der Welt, Jener Welt, and the Roosevelt. This world, the world to come in the same breath, and the Roosevelt. I've seen pictures of New York Jewry, New York Jews, hearing the news of, of FDR's passing with tears cascading down their cheeks. OK, so this brings us to 1939 and this voyage of the SS St. Louis, the most famous or infamous of the doomed ships. Doomed ships. On board are 937 Jewish passengers, all of them with legitimate paperwork to get them to Cuba. And it cost them a fortune, fortune, fortune. Ay, 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 ay. They borrowed and borrowed and borrowed. They have the money to get safe passage to land and dock in Cuba. Of the 937, 736 have legitimate visas to America, but they will only be valid in three months' time. When the boat is docked in Havana, it is tethered to the port. You can look up and see the passengers. The Cubans want the bribe. Now, in South America, Central America, Latin America, a bribe is a way of life. I'll bet you, I'll bet you, that one of the first words you learn in Spanish is El Bribo. So if they want a bribe, what should you do? If they want a bribe, give them a bribe. Right? How to say in Staples? That was simple. But the leader of American Jewry, his name was? Correct, Rabbi Stephen S. Wise. The quintessential reform rabbi, good crop of hair, well-built, stage presence, oratorical abilities, cushy cushy with FDR, Eleanor, members of the cabinet. He was not willing to violate the law. And the irony of ironies was, is that a cultured jury was willing to, prepare, to spend millions, if that's what it took, to house and educate, but not to violate the law. 
The captain of the ship, Gustav Schroeder, a German, was a benevolent, magnanimous humanitarian. He figures America is a humane country. Surely America will take them. He goes up and down the eastern seaboard. How does America greet the boat? By sending a Coast Guard cutter to intercept. Had they jumped off and been able to swim the 40 miles to Miami, they would have been sent back. And in the end, which country accepts them? There wasn't a country on the face of the earth willing to offer haven. They go back from whence they had come, and almost all of them perish. How many of you are familiar with the Musi negotiations? Musi. M-U-S-A. Jean-Marie Musi, as I suspected, which means you don't read enough Teller books, but it's <laughs> rectifiable. Musi was the former Swiss president. He was a friend of Himmler, a Nazi sympathizer. But by the end of the war, he had readjusted his perspective. In the Vad Hatzalah in America, not to be confused with the ambulance corps, the great rabbis of America, Rabbi Aaron Cutler, Rabbi Lazar Silver, Rom Kalmanovich, Rabbi Yeshaber Salavechik, and important lay leaders like Mike Tress, Irving Bunim, Stephen S. Klein, Louis Septimus, did everything they could, just the dim light and the darkness of the Holocaust, to try and save Jewry. And now they had negotiated through the famous Sternbach family in Switzerland to try and save those Jews still alive in the camps. Hitler said it's destruction of the Jewry to the very end. And the error that's always made is people think Hitler blamed the Jews to gain power. Incorrect. The sad fact is he gained power in order to murder the Jews. How else can you explain the fact when he's losing on two fronts and desperately needs materiel and to evacuate and trains orders from the very top or the trains cannot be diverted from the destruction of Hungarian Jewry. Destruction of Jews, Iberalis. But Himmler's more practical. He wanted to save his skin, and he was very concerned that he was the top cop. That means the guards in the camps, the concentration camps, extermination camps, slave labor camps, transportation camps, they were all his deputies. He didn't want them to be treated as war criminals. He wanted to be treated as conventional POWs. And therefore, he was willing to negotiate with the Sternbach family through Musi's offices. And in the end, at first they wanted medicine, then trucks, and then for five million Swiss francs, about the equivalent of one million dollars, they were willing to save the approximately 800,000 to 600,000 Jews still alive in Europe or in the camps. Now, the Vat Hatzalah did not have a million dollars, but the Joint Distribution Committee did have a million. So Rabbi Aaron Cutler, who looked like the quintessential Lithuanian Rosh Hashiva Dean, short, gray, long black coat, stooped, maybe a tad of dandruff, does not converse in English, speaks Yiddish, does not appear to be politically savvy, although he's an extraordinarily clever person. He goes with Irving Bunim, his translator from Young Israel, to the Joint's headquarters. And he speaks with them that we have to come up with the money, $1 million to save what would have been the greatest rescue effort in the history of history, nearly 800,000 Jews left in Europe. The Joint says, we can't do it. It means violating the British blockade, which was sacrosanct. It's after Pearl Harbor, it means trading with the enemy, which is a felonious offense. For all I know, it's a treasonous offense. To the rabbis of America, the yeshiva rabbis of America, it is despicable to violate American law and odious to give money to the Nazis. And yet and yet, there's a higher law, and the higher law is pikuch nefesh to save a life. And the higher law is pidyon shvim to rescue a captive. And the higher law is arvut responsibility, one Jew towards his brother. And he begs and cajoles and wheedles, and finally they say, okay, we'll give you the money provided you get a license from the American government, we can give a million dollars to the Nazi enemy. Ravon Cutler is willing to do anything to save the life of a Jew. He travels to Washington with a raging fever. Irving Bunim serves as his translator. They go to the White House. And apparently the president felt that the plight of 800,000 Jews was not important enough for his time. He sends them to his hyper-assimilated secretary of the treasury, Henry Morgenthau, Jr. And you can imagine, being a secretary in FDR's cabinet, you have to be an extremely assimilated Jew, which he was. And there is no way in the world he's going to authorize $1 million of taxpayer money to save these Jews in Europe. 
And again, Rabbi Cutler pleads and cajoles and wheedles. He will not give in. In desperation, Rabbi Cutler says to Bunim, tell him, you are worthless, and Washington is meaningless if you can't save the life of one child in Europe. There is no way that Irving Bunim is going to tell Henry Morgenthau Jr. in the White House that you are worthless and Washington is meaningless. So he gives him a milk toast version. The rabbi is very disappointed. We hope in the future you can be of greater help. Now, Rabbi Aaron Cutler does not understand English, but he was, as I like to joke, an observant Jew. <laughs> and he sees from Henry Morgenthau Jr.'s expression that what he had said had not been accurately translated. He said, Bunim, Zagam Chlor Vizachom Kizach, tell him precisely what I told you. At that point, Irving Bunim looks down his shoelaces, sees his socks are pulled up and other matters of sartorial concern. And he says in a barely audible tone, Mr. Secretary, the rabbis asked me to inform you that you are worthless and Washington is meaningless if you can't save the life of one child in Europe. At that point, Henry Morgenthau Jr. collapses on the table like this for what appears to be an eternity at least. When he finally raises his head, his eyes are deltas of red, the tears cascading down his cheeks, to tell the rabbi, I've not forgotten who I am. And I put my neck on the chopping block to save my brethren. Ultimately, this plan was scuttled by American Jewry and Swiss Jewry, and Litter himself intervened to, make sure, intervened to make sure it wouldn't happen. But Henry Morgenthau Jr. will always be remembered as a man who's willing to sacrifice his career on behalf of his brethren. And here's a very important take-home message. We have to make decisions in life. You can make the convenient one for which you'll be forgotten, or the difficult one for which you'll always be remembered. Here's one more example, a little better known. Oscar Schindler was a dishonest businessman, a womanizer. He saved nearly 1,200 Jews during the Holocaust. Had it not been for the latter, if he'd be remembered, and that's a major if, he'd be remembered as a creep. And that name Schindler is synonymous with heroism, bravery, courage, self-sacrifice, synonymous. Like Vaseline means petroleum jelly, in Q-tips means cotton swabs, in Kleenex means tissues, Schindler means self-sacrifice. He changed his name, and we can too. Okay, listen quickly. <laughs> How do you do that? I don't even know. Can we go another three hours? <laughs> Pushing it. I want to try and explain, as I, if I can, the oxymoron of ghetto life. You all know what an oxymoron is. Like army intelligence. <laughs> or my all-time favorite, family vacation, <laughs> as if there was such a thing. Uh, life in the ghetto is not life as we know it. To be eligible for a ration card, you have to work in excess of 12 hours a day, very arduous work. It could easily be 15 hours, 17 hours, or 19 hours. I'm talking about, I can burn on a treadmill nearly 500 calories in half an hour. So we're talking about I'm not telling you what to do an hour because you don't have the strength, but it's about 1,000 calories an hour. That's what they were doing, schlepping heavy sacks of cement, or rail ties up and down hills. So you're talking about working, let's just round it to 15 hours a day. So they're burning 15,000 calories. Now, a diet for a woman, according to American standards, not my expertise, a diet for a woman is somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 calories a day. If you were to consume 1,500 calories a day, you would lose an enormous amount of weight. So they're burning 15,000 calories a day to, eligible, to make them eligible for a ration card for them, their spouse, and two children. And what if you have four children, or five children, or in my instance, 18 children, and an elderly grandmother, and an aunt, and a brother? This one ration card has to be divided among all of these. One more time. You're burning 15,000 calories. And it's got to be shared among other people. And the ration card was for 181 calories. That's guaranteed starvation. The SS doctors informed the Gestapo a matter of weeks at most, everyone would be dead from starvation, which is an extremely gruesome death. And they did not take into account the ingenuity of the Jews to smuggle food, to grow food, to stretch food, but everyone was starving. That's why in my family we don't say starving. You know, you skip a meal, hi, I'm starving. But before you weighed 148 pounds, and now you weigh 61 pounds, that's starving. You're a bag of bones, no subcutaneous fat. It's too painful to sit down, to lie down, to walk. 
That's starving. And that's one aspect of ghetto life, which crazed the head. There's cold that you've never experienced. This is a hot day. Even if you come from Canada, we're talking about minus 30 degrees. In the Warsaw Ghetto, 150,000 are naked. The body cannot deal with these temperatures. The old and the young are dropping like flies. And then in the Ludge Ghetto, for example, 3% of the toilets worked. It's 46 to a room on top of each other. Picture the smallest room in your house. If you don't have a small room, picture a closet. 46 religious, not religious, anti-religious, non-Jews who thought they were Jews, who thought the Germans thought they were Jews, all on top of each other. There is disease, famous disease like we know, like typhus, typhoid, spotted fever, tuberculosis, and diseases you've never heard of because of an absence of nutrition, which we're not accustomed to. Everyone suffering from shigella, bacillary dysentery, horrible diarrhea. In the Ludge Ghetto, 3% of the toilets worked. Let's say you're one of the fortunate ones and you live in a building which has a working toilet. You get up in the morning with horrific diarrhea and you're 46th online. How do you feel? And when your turn finally comes, it's not like there was a cleaning crew who cleaned up before you. And before you get to the bowl, they're banging in there for you to get out for the next person who wants to come in. That's the fortunate ones with a toilet. But if only 3% of the toilets work, that means they're a mephitic stench to the high heavens. You're living in a sewer. And it's an olfactory assault that's constant, dynamic, and perpetual. And there's humiliation. These are just a few aspects of so-called ghetto life. OK, we're going to skip a little bit, not that you would know. And that brings us back to the children. And I'm honored that you're here this evening. Uh, the children, as we mentioned, is a story that's hard to tell. As a rule, children did not survive. Wrenched away from their parents, hard to manage. In the squalor of the ghetto, nearly impossible to manage. And once they fall under Nazi dominion, they do not follow instructions well. They're not good as slave laborers, and they're almost immediately liquidated. As a rule, less than 3% of the children survived. One and a half million children under the age of 12 perished at the hands of the Nazis. And that's what we took upon ourselves to try and be that voice. And thank you again, Vivian, for your incredible assistance to be that voice for the one and a half million muffled voices. Uh, I just want to conclude by telling you, in Yad Vashem, there is a children's memorial, which is worth seeing. You walk into a room, thanks to the genius of the architect, which is as black as black can be, and it looks like a million candles to commemorate the one and a half million children. And you hear a tape in Yiddish, Hebrew and in English, of the names of children who perished. You hear this tape until you want to run out. But as Rabbi Berowine pointed out, the one name you don't hear is your own. If you are of Ashkenazic ancestry, the only reason that you're alive and you're here is thanks to a miracle. And I think about this every single day. Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our leader, had many beautiful names. Yedidya, Avigdor, Tuvya, and yet and yet he was always referred to as Moshe, he was drawn forth from the water. And he always wanted that visage before his eyes that he could have been alligator fodder in the bottom of the river. So if we were saved, it must be do something significant for ourselves and for our people and for no other reason for those who did not manage to survive. Thank you very much for coming. On the side over there, aside from the carbohydrates, you'll find my books. I think you'll find them enriching. I know I will. Thank you. would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD.
Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to Jem. To Jem. Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.